Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Notice the Bible says one verse tonight. Marriage is honorable in all, Amen. and the bed undefiled. Amen. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Amen. Sounds like Nahum. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, please bless the message tonight. I ask for a fresh filling of thy spirit as I preach this kind of teachy message this evening on a very important subject. Lord, you know my heart. I, I have a desire to be a blessing uh, to the families, every family unit in this church. And Lord, we know that we need biblical principles in our lives in order to have your blessings upon us. So I pray as we learn these that you'd please help me to convey them. I pray that you'd fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit tonight. Remove any distractions from this room and from our minds this evening. And may your word go forth with a power and a clarity tonight. For we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone has your sheet tonight, correct? If not, raise your hand. All right. Well, tonight I want to move forward in this Helps for the Home series uh, with a new subtopic. Now, so far we've dealt with the idea of principles for getting to the marriage altar uh, biblically. And the idea was that as someone is planning to get to the marriage altar, there are certain Bible principles that they should employ. Amen? Amen. Things that will bring glory to God. Things that will help you keep your testimony. Things that will greatly reduce future problems in your marriage. And that is by applying these biblical principles for courtship. Uh, not worldly dating as the world does it, but these idea, the idea is courtship. And over the past several weeks, we looked at five of those principles. Now we looked at the first one was patience. The second one was compatibility. Uh, the third one was authority. The fourth one was preparedness. And then the fifth one, I actually didn't do a whole message on it, but I touched on it uh, in another message, and that was the principle of purity. And I hope that you understand those. Now, tonight I'd like to deal with this next subject, which is the permanence of marriage. Amen. Now, this is something that people need to understand, Amen. excuse me, before they get married. Amen. As they're entering into marriage, the questions we want to answer tonight are these. Number one... What does the Bible teach about the permanence of marriage? Uh, number two is, is divorce a biblical option? And then number three is remarriage something that God approves? And hopefully we'll get through this uh, this evening. I think we should. Now remember that the home is the first of three institutions that God has ordained in his word. Some may say four institutions. Of course, one would be the home in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, the second would be human government in Genesis chapter 9. We could say Israel's Old Testament theocracy in Genesis chapter 12. That was an institution, no doubt. And then we know the New Testament church in Matthew chapter 16. But let's for, never forget that the home was the first institution. Institution. And every home begins with a marriage. And strong marriages are the bedrock of a strong society. I hope you still believe that. You know, but because of man's sin nature and our increasing departure from the Word of God as a nation, divorce, which was once considered against the public's interest, that's interesting, that was a quote from the government, divorce was against the public interest, has now become a common occurrence. You know, in 1867, it was the first year that divorce rates were recorded. And the United States had a divorce rate, guess, get this, in 1867 of 3%. As time progressed, of course, the divorce rate increased. It rose to 16% in the 1930s, then to 25% in the 1960s, to a rate of nearly 50% today. And by the way, second marriages, the divorce rate, 67%. Some may say, well, the second time might be better. Well, it doesn't sound like it. Third marriages, 73%. It's crazy, is it not? You know, before the latter decades of the 20th century, in order to, uh, for a divorce to be granted, fault had to be proved. Not anymore. It used to be abandonment, cruelty, or adultery were considered ground for divorce. But in 1969, California introduced no-fault di uh, divorce 
which now exists in all states. Every state has it. And today you can get uh, divorced for reasons like simply irreconcilable differences. In other words, we just don't get along. You can get a divorce for loss of affection. Imagine that. You can even get a divorce today online for $137. You know, in 2015, the, and by, by the way, divorce laws are guarded by each state has their different laws. It's not a federal thing, but it's interesting. All of them today have the no-fault divorce. And in 2015, the Manhattan Supreme Court ruled that divorce papers could be served through Facebook. It's getting crazy, is it not? So today, where do we stand in this 21st century? Well, the average length of a marriage is 11 years. Women file for two-thirds of all divorces, and 90% of all divorces are settled out of court. So what does the Bible teach about all of this? Should divorce be a viable option? Well, let's talk about that uh, this evening, because if you are here tonight and you are thinking about marriage or marriage is in the sh near future, then understand you need to enter that marriage if you're a believer with a biblical position on marriage and the, bi the biblical decision on divorce as well. So let's talk about that tonight. Notice number one, let's consider uh, the design of marriage. The design of marriage. Now you know most of this, I think, but uh, hopefully I'll touch on a lot. Go back to Genesis chapter 2, if you would. Genesis chapter 2. Now remember that marriage, don't, don't miss this now, marriage is a divine institution. It is not something that man dreamed up. It is something that God has designed. Just like an architect has a blueprint, and this is the house I want, God has a design for marriage. Uh, there's a design. What is it? Well, notice, write this down before we read the text. Letter A, let's talk about the concept of marriage. Notice Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, speaking of Eve, I'm just jumping down to verse 23 here. Uh, sorry, 24. Um, no, I'm in 23. Let me read it again. Uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Here it is. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Please notice the pronouns here. He she, his, her, right? Yes. Man, woman. Now, really the concept of marriage is a very simple concept. It's not difficult. Okay. It consists of, it's amazing how many words you have to put together today to describe marriage. Now we have to add the word biological. One biological man, you used to have to say one man, and uh, in the world they say, well, it depends on how I feel today. One biological man, amen, and one biological woman who have committed themselves to one another to live as husband and wife for the rest of their life. Amen. It's not that hard. Anything outside of one man, one woman design is a perversion of God's design. And in reality, I know this is not uh, politically correct, but in reality, it's not marriage. Amen. It's not. Amen. Uh, by the way, sorry, Mayor, Mayor Pete, nobody is born gay. Amen. <laughs> That's what the Bible teaches. Nobody Amen. is. Amen. It is a choice. I'm sure you've heard the article, the San Antonio City Council rejected the inclusion of Chick-fil-A from the new concession agreement at San Antonio, in San Antonio International Airport. They were banned. Why were they banned? They were banned because of the company's alleged, quote, legacy of anti-LGBTQ behavior. We're going to have more letters, I'm sure, as time goes on. Chick-fil-A has caught a lot of grief because of their stand on traditional marriage. I like to call it biblical marriage. But may I say this? Thank God for their stand. Matter of fact, it was funny because we were hearing these things, and I looked over. We were at Lowe's the other day, and I looked back at the drive through at Chick-fil-A, and that thing's packed all the time. Praise the Lord. God is blessing there. Amen. For their stand. But understand, this is where we are today. The Bible declares that God's concept of marriage, this one man and one woman, biological, for life, with biological children, is a good thing. Amen. 
Hebrews 13, 4, we just read it a moment ago. Marriage is honorable in all, and the, the, the bed is undefiled. So it's an honorable thing. Proverbs 18, 22, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, Amen. and obtaineth favor of the Lord. It is good because it is God's design. So we see the concept of marriage. Go right back to Genesis, and you find it there. It's a man leaving this family to make a new family and joining a wife in marriage to make that family. It's very, very simple, a simple concept. Amen. So we see the concept of marriage. But let it be, notice we have the covenant of marriage. Now, some psychologists have suggested, and some treat marriage as a contract. It is not a contract. Do you all understand that? Amen. A contract has conditions, does it not? It has conditional causes. In other words, each party uh, has certain responsibilities when you enter into a contract. And if one party doesn't fulfill their part of the contract or the other party doesn't fulfill theirs, that contract can be ended because of that. That's not marriage. Amen. Not at all. Marriage is a covenant and not a contract. Now go all the way to the last book of the Old Testament and the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi chapter 2. I love this verse. Seems a little confusing, out of context, but we'll read it anyway. Notice Malachi 2 and verse 14. I'll give you a moment to get there. I have it marked. I'm, I know we're going there. Last book of the Old Testament. Notice, yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet, notice, is she thy companion, the wife of thy what? Covenant. So marriage is an unconditional covenant with God and with your spouse. Nowhere in the marriage vows do people say, if the husband loves his wife as he ought to, then the wife will continue in the marriage. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say if the wife will submit as she ought to to the husband, then the husband will continue in the marriage. No, there are no conditional clauses. None. Marriage, again, is not a contract. It is an unconditional covenant and a commitment that two people make to each other and to God. When you stand there at that altar and you take those vows, understand it's not just a witness of people that see it. It's not just a preacher that hears it. Uh, the angels hear it and God himself hears it as well. And you have entered into a covenant. And that's very important. This is the design of God. This is what it's all about. Its concept is one man, one woman for life. We'll see that in a moment here. And then it's a covenant. It's a covenant with God. So we see, number one, the design of marriage. Notice number two, the duration of marriage. So how long is marriage supposed to last? Well, depends on who you ask. Well, let's look at the Bible. Amen. The Bible is very clear that marriage is designed to last for life. Amen? Entire life. Let's look at a few verses. Let's go over to Romans chapter 7. Now remember, when a couple says their wedding vows, they typically go like this. Do you, so-and-so, take so-and-so to be your lawfully wedded wife or husband, depending on who you're talking to, to have and to hold from this day forward in poverty and wealth, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others till death do you part? And then usually the right response is supposed to be, I do. Again, you're agreeing that's a vow you're making to God on the duration of marriage. And it's not just because you make the vow to God. It's because of the duration of marriage being for life is a biblical principle. It is in the Word of God. Notice Romans chapter 7 and look at verse 2. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he what? liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. 
So that if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. I can't think of a passage that's more clear than that. That the duration of marriage is for life. It's a covenant that you make for life. Turn over a little bit to the right to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39. I'm going to look at a bunch of verses tonight. I said this is kind of a teachy type sermon, but it's something that's important because uh, you and I, all of us, anybody that enters into marriage is, has to understand there's going to be trials. There's going to be difficulties. Uh, and if you enter into that uh, with the determination in your heart, this is for life, then you will, by God's grace, work through those difficulties. Got a little bit ahead of myself on that one, but I'll revisit that in a moment. Notice 1 Corinthians 7, 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband, what? Liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. Again, it's the same thing as Romans chapter 7, the duration of marriage. One other place, well, yeah, let's, I'll read, I'll quote that one. Go over to Matthew chapter 19. And I, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to have the time here to get into the specifics of this. But in Matthew chapter 19, you remember when the Lord was approached by the Pharisees, in verse 3, they came to him and asked him the question in verse 3, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3, and he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. Here it is, watch this, and we say this, by the way, preachers typically do in a marriage ceremony. We often use this verse before we dismiss the uh, couple and introduce them. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, I know verse 7 through 9 talks about why did Moses then uh, command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away. Uh, he saith unto them, Moses, because of, notice, the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. The idea is this, is from the beginning God's design has always been that marriage is supposed to endure for your entire life. And divorce should not be an option. By the way, if you're wondering about God's opinion on that, the word for divorce, divorcement, uh, sometimes it uses putting away. We read, and we won't go there for time's sake, but we'll read in Malachi 2 and verse 16, for the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. God hates it, so why would God condone something that he hates? Why would a preacher give advice or counsel to do something that God hates? We shouldn't do that. So, again, my counsel would always be, and I'm going to get into some specifics here in a little bit, uh, work it out and uh, uh, apply God's principles here. Because once you are married, you are to be married for life. Amen. That's the Bible truth. Someone, so, so if someone has the idea of going into marriage, I can marry, you know, and if it, if it doesn't work out, I'll just find somebody else and divorce. That's not, you, you don't understand the biblical principle of marriage. God's way is in, to endure for life. Now notice, let's go through these A, B, C, and D, because you get a lot of questions when you talk about this, and hopefully, hear me out now, don't tune me out if I said something you didn't like yet, uh, or up to this point, just give me a moment to explain some things, right? Marriage is a covenant for life, letter A, write this down, despite pre-salvation decisions, Despite pre-salvation decisions. Some people try to justify divorce by saying things like this. Well, I wasn't saved when I got married. I, the idea is that, well, I did the wrong thing, therefore, I guess I can throw this one out and start over. Some people say that. Some say, I've heard this, I wasn't thinking when I got married. I didn't understand things. I even heard somebody say this one time, believe it or not, I was drunk when I got married. I said, that's really sad. That really is. That's a problem. Uh, that's a big problem. 
Some say, I was too young to be married. Some say, I really didn't know him. I really didn't know her. I didn't know what I was getting when I got married. Or some say, I didn't even know God when I got married. Well, all those or any of those things may be so, but it does not nullify your vow to God. God still heard the vow, and we are still accountable for everything, amen, that we do in our lives. Thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about that, takes care of things, amen, and our sins and all that. But understand, vows before salvation are still vows. Uh, a lie is still a lie. The truth is still the truth and so forth. Ecclesiastes 5.4 When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Again, if you say a vow, we are accountable to God for that vow. Amen. And that includes marriage. And he still recognizes marriage despite your pre-salvation decisions. Uh, letter B, marriage is a covenant for life. Also, despite your current situations, you may be in a very difficult marriage. You may be. A lot of people are. Even if you're saved. Maybe your spouse isn't saved. Maybe you know the Lord, or you got saved during your, while you were married, and so forth, but your spouse is not. That's difficult. Maybe your spouse is backslidden and not living for God. That's a difficult thing as well. Amen. Maybe there's a spouse that has committed adultery on you. That's a tough thing to deal with. Maybe you're in a marriage and you have a spouse that's not very kind to you. And maybe you're in a marriage that, uh, that your spouse has gotten involved and God forbid any of these things, but I'm just, I'm just trying to be real here tonight, is that okay? Uh, that's gotten involved in alcohol or, or drugs uh, or gambling and things like that. That's a difficult thing. Amen. But can I say this? You're still married to them. Amen. And marriage is still a covenant for life. And that's why you say, preacher, you say this stuff about the homo. This is why. Because once you're married, that's your spouse for the rest of your life. It's foolish to marry someone that's not the will of God because that person becomes the will of God when you do that. That's why we flag all these signs and warnings and, and say, hey, hey, don't make this mistake. It's the biggest mistake you can make outside of rejecting Jesus Christ in your entire life, marrying the wrong person. And you got to live with it for the rest of your life. You say, preacher, th th this is a pretty grim thought here. Maybe so. What do I do? Let me show you what you do, spouse. There's some admonitions in the Bible, instructions for what to do. One of them's for the wife. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. You say, how do I deal with it? Well, if you're a wife, let me tell you what you don't do. You don't nag. You don't beat them over the head with the Bible. Look at verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, you say, that's my situation, they also may without the word be won. How? By the conversation of the wives. That's an old English word, which means behavior. It's not talking about your words. It's talking about your behavior. Notice verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know what he's saying here is the way you reach your spouse, wife, that is away from God or is not saved, it's you be the very best Christian you can be, and God will use your life to convict that person, that man in this case, of his sin and his wickedness or whatever it is, and draw him to God. Amen. Your behavior. Look back at 1 Corinthians uh, 7, 14. And let me show you something there. Go there because we're going to read verse 15 in a moment. 
Same principle here. What do I do uh, when I'm in a terrible situation? Live for God. Do your best to live the Christian life and be the very best godly, Christ-like wife you can be. And God will use that to touch the heart of your spouse. Again, notice 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 14. The Bible says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are, now are they holy. Basically saying, if the, if the husband's an unbeliever, the wife's testimony is going to win him, and vice versa there. And God can even use the children in that home if they get saved and live for the Lord to affect that spouse for God. You may be the very instrument that God uses to bring your spouse to him or back to him. And it's very important. But understand, despite your current situation, marriage is still a covenant for life. Amen. It still is. Let her see. Write this down. So notice, marriage is a covenant for life despite pre-salvation decisions. Let her be beside, despite current situations. But here, thirdly, because I know what some of you might be thinking, uh, maybe not, but I thought this. Let her see. Remember safety considerations. Amen. You say, what do you mean by that? While marriage is, marriage is a covenant for life, there are certain situations in marriage that I believe would warrant a separation. I believe that. 1 Corinthians 7, 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Uh, one such case would be, that I believe would warrant a separation, would be a safety consideration. Amen. In other words, if somebody is being abused in a marriage, uh, uh, either physically harmed or mentally abused, or when a spouse feels physically threatened by their spouse, if they are in a violent relationship, if safety is an issue, certainly the spouse should immediately leave. Amen. Immediately. By the way, I would suggest also, depending on how, which one of that that fit, calling the police. Amen. And uh, maybe even uh, thinking or considering a PFA, uh, pr protection from abuse. Do whatever you need to do to get yourself safe. Understand what I'm saying. Yes, marriage is a covenant for life, no doubt. But there are certain times uh, when there ought to be a separation. God does not demand that we remain in the presence of an abusive person. Amen. But... While a separation could be an indefinite thing and may even end up being a permanent thing depending on the situation, I still believe that marriage is a covenant for life. I still believe that God, even through that separation, that could be the very thing that God uses to work in that person's life, that spouse's life, to make that marriage what it could be for God. Work in his heart. Maybe he gets saved. Maybe he gets right with God. The goal is always repentance, and eventually the goal is always reconciliation. If they're living for the Lord and get some things straight in their life. Certainly it has to be a slow process. I understand all that. My point is this. Again, marriage is a covenant despite pre-salvation decisions, despite your current situation. But always remember safety considerations as well. But even so, I never, I don't personally, I believe it's in the Bible. I never counsel for divorce. I don't. It is a covenant for life. Letter D, write this down if you would. Some conclusions. So what do we conclude from this idea of the duration of marriage? Uh, marriage should be entered into with the understanding that I am in this thing for life. You should enter it saying, no matter what happens, no matter what goes on, even if that person uh, backslides and gets away from God, uh, commits a sin against me, and is not very kind, no matter what happens, we are going to work things out. That's the attitude you ought to have entering into marriage, which means that it is a good idea to never use the word divorce with your spouse. Don't do it. Don't use it as a threat. Do not use it as a joke. 
Well, I'll just divorce you. That's not funny. It's a very serious thing. Do not use that word in your household. It is not a healthy word to use. Also, I personally, I'm just going to throw this in under some conclusions. You might want to, well, you don't have to write this down. I, don't, I personally don't believe in prenuptial agreements. Now, you may, you may not, that's fine. But I think prenuptial agreements are mere, merely planning for and expecting uh, divorce. If you enter into the marriage saying, I'm in this for life, then you, you don't need a, a prenuptial. If you feel you need that, then you probably shouldn't be getting married to that person. Amen. You probably shouldn't. So we see, number one, the design of marriage. Number two, the duration of marriage. Number three, write this down. We're on the other side now. The devastation of divorce. Let's talk about this. While divorce should never be an option, the truth of the matter is it does happen. I mean, especially with the no-fault divorces we have and so forth, online divorces you can get for 137 bucks. It can happen in a moment. And going through a divorce is always, always, always a devastating thing. It is a very difficult thing. I've seen people go through them. I've watched the wicked and evil things that are said and done. Ugliness that goes through that. It is always devastating. Consider letter A, the casualties of divorce. Everyone involved suffers in some way, to some degree, when a divorce takes place. Amen. Everybody. There's the mental and emotional anguish of each spouse, the mental and emotional anguish of the children, Amen. the financial price to be paid, other family members that get involved. You have to go through things uh, like the division of assets, the division of debt. Then there's the battle over child custody and visitation times and child support and spousal support. All of that. There, there's always casualties and there's always mental, emotional, and physical anguish. Then for a believer, think of the other casualties besides all the people and finances involved. There's the testimony that is now weakened in that area. And there's your influence in the area of marriage has now been lessened and some positions in the church, according to the word of God, have been forfeited. We know the pastor and the deacon. My point is this. There are many spiritual, emotional, and physical heartaches when a divorce takes place. By the way, I also believe, and I, I, we can, let's go there because I may, might get a look here. Matthew chapter 19. I really don't see anybody's looks except for this front row. And they look pretty good tonight, especially this lady here on my left to the end here. She looks really good. Amen. We're talking about marriage, and I'm looking at my wife here. Amen. Marriage, not the marriage. Matthew 19 and verse 9. I believe, I really do, I believe that the Bible is clear that if a person does get divorced, that that person should not remarry unless that spouse is deceased. Amen. Here's what I mean. But Matthew 19, 9, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And notice this, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit, commit adultery. We saw the same principle in Romans chapter 7, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as well. My point is this, is that divorce wrecks things. It leaves a plethora of casualties in its path. It is an absolute wrecking machine. And so often people think, well, this will make me happy. Oh, the things they have to go through. And sometimes for the rest of their life, because of divorce, is traumatizing. It's terrible. It's difficult. And then throw children in the mix and grandchildren and family members and all of that. Oh, my soul. It's a terrible thing. Many casualties to divorce. But then let her be, I'm going to give you this, the clemency towards divorcees. Uh, clemency, C-L-E-M-E-N-C-Y, Brother Cordry, right? I'm just, I, I was going to pick on somebody out here, but I don't want them to get mad at me. I can deal with, you don't get mad at anybody, so I can say anything. Uh, what does that mean? The mercy or forgiveness. Now watch this, stay with me now. Just like any biblical principle that is violated, there is forgiveness and restoration through Jesus Christ. And so if you're here tonight and you have gone through a divorce or a divorce, 
divorce and a remarriage, understand something, and this is a flip side. Yeah, God's against it, but there is forgiveness and restoration through Jesus Christ. Amen. There always is. If you would simply realize that that was not God's perfect will, and that God had a better way, and ask for forgiveness, and if you're remarried, make your current marriage or your single situation the very best that it can be for God. Amen. And God will restore you. Amen. By the way, just an FYI as well, I don't believe that remarriage, and some people do, and I've heard this on several occasions, I don't believe that remarriage is considered perpetual adultery. By that I mean, some say that if you're divorced and remarried, that you should divorce your current wife and go back and try to reconcile with your, fir your first. Boy, that's a mess on top of a mess. Uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. And some take that position. I don't believe it is. Stay in your current marriage, live for God, and serve the Lord together as a couple. Amen? Amen. I also don't believe that a divorced person or a divorced and remarried person is somehow, somehow bought from serving God. Some people take that position. Oh, they can't teach, they can't do this, they can't do that. I say, where is that in the Bible? Uh, where do you find that? The only thing I see is the pastor and the deacon. I understand that. But certainly they can serve the Lord, uh, no doubt. They're not barred from service to God. Uh, believe it or not, some of the best Christians I know are Christians that have been divorced or divorced and remarried. And I'm not saying because of it. I'm saying because of God's forgiveness and grace. Amen? Again, my point is this. Divorce is a devastating thing. But there is forgiveness and restoration through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see, number one, the divorce, design of marriage. Number two, I'm going I'm to run through these last ones real quick. The duration of marriage. Number three, the devastation of divorce. And then lastly, so, number four, some deterrence to divorce. So, by the way, if you're in a marriage now, uh, it doesn't matter how many years you've been in that marriage, whether, husband, you think you need it or not, you need to work on that marriage. We always have to work on it. We always have to. Always. Never ends. Amen? You're always learning. You're always growing and so forth. So how can, how can we make sure that we don't, we don't get divorced? What can we do? Well, let's look at it. Letter A, write this down. Number one, have a personal walk with God. That's where it starts. You want to be a good husband. You want to be a good wife. Start with your own heart. Have a personal walk with God. Daily devotions, daily Bible reading. Again, your spouse's behavior is out of your control, but your behavior is not. And again, so to be the best spouse you can be, it's not to point out all the faults of your spouse, but for you to do the right thing yourself. Be the best spouse you can be and give God the rest. And that's going to require having a personal walk with God. Amen. Letter B, here's a second one to turn to divorce. And that is this, communicate with your spouse. Amen. Talk, communicate. By the way, especially husbands. Yep. Ephesians chapter 5, it makes a really interesting parallel here. It says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, watch this, with the washing of water by the word. And so again, husbands, remember you want your spouse by communication. You remember Romeo, how you were? Uh, you will keep your spouse by communication Amen. as well. Talk with your spouse. Spend time with your spouse. Work on it. Uh, be willing. Here, here's a good one. Ben, this is part of the communication. Be willing to talk about problems. Amen. Be willing to receive criticism. Amen. Amen. Uh, be willing to see things from their perspective. Ah, you're just being silly. That's what you are. Hold the bus there. You better be careful with that kind of attitude. If there's something that bothers your spouse about you, you ought to listen to that and do your very best to fix it. Amen. All, all the men said amen right there. And then number three, letter C also is this. Be humble. So have a personal walk with God. Communicate with your spouse and then be humble. You know what the root cause of contention is? One thing and one thing alone, 
pride. Amen. Proverbs 13, 10. Only by pride cometh contention. You in an argument with someone, someone got you out of joint, I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is pride. Because we just have to be right. We just have to have things our own way. And that attitude will never work in marriage. By the way, I'm going to spend some more time on these types of things in Lord willing, the weeks to come. And then letter D is this, and the last one, we're trying to talk about deterrence to divorce, and that is this, have a forgiving spirit. Amen. Amen. You are going to get offended by your spouse. Offenses will come, the Lord said. I know great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. But something's going to happen that's going to get you out of joint. And so what you have to do is be forgiving. Have a forgiving spirit. You say, how often should I forgive my spouse? Well, go to Matthew chapter 18 and see what Jesus said to Peter when he said, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? What did Christ say? No, till 70 times seven. In other words, the idea, the Christian, the one who wants to act like a Christian, will forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And by the way, if you are going to have a successful marriage, that's what's going to be required. You are going to have to to forgive again and again and by the way be forgiven again and again and again and again yes. Ephesians 4:32 and be ye kind one to another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you folks marriage has been designed by God one man Amen. biological biological woman for life that's its duration. And it is designed to be a wonderful, wonderful thing Amen. if we apply God's principles. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together.